the performance last night. Y'all really missed out on a treat. We had a, a quite a few uh, folks from the church that, uh, that were involved in that. So uh, from Miss Robin to Miss Jackie, Miss Kim, we had Kelly and Samantha and Marianne, Reagan, Bridget, Casey, and even Miss Brooke got in on the action a little bit. So y'all really missed a treat. So uh, with that, in fact, y'all don't need to miss out. Y'all ladies, y'all come forward and do a little number for them. And, and, but, the, uh, but with that, I, I tell you, I enjoyed it. Y'all, y'all worked, worked hard, and it, was, uh, it, it showed, and it paid off. So y'all did an excellent, excellent job. So, um, so with that... Here we go, chapter 6 and verse 1 of the book of Nehemiah. It says, Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors in the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem said to me, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them, saying, I'm doing a great work, and I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and come down to you? But they sent me this message four times, and I answered them in the same manner. Then Sanballat sent his servants to me before the fifth time, and an open letter in his hand, and it was written, it is reported among the nations, that Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall, that you may be their king. And, that, and you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. Then I said to him, saying, No such things as you, are, as you say are being done, but you invent them in your own heart. For they, are all, for they all were trying to make us afraid, saying, Their hands will be weakened in the work, and it will not be done. Now, therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. Afterwards, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, and the son of Methetabel, who was a secret informer. And he said, Let us meet together in the house of God within the temple, and let us close the doors of the temple, for they are coming to kill you. Indeed, at night they will come to kill you. And I said, Should a man such as I flee? And who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this reason, and he was hired, that I should be afraid and act the way and sin." so that they might have a cause for an evil report, that they might reproach me. My God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat according to their works, the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul, in the 52 days. And it happened when all of our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us saw these things, that they were very disheartened in their own eyes. For they perceived that this work was done by our God. Also in those days, the nobles of Judah sent many letters to Tobiah, and the letters of Tobiah came to them. For many in Judah were pledged to him, because he was the son-in-law of Shechaniah, the son of Ara, the son of Johanan, and married the daughter of Meshulam, and the daughter of Berechiah. Also, they reported his deeds before me and reported my words to him. Tobiah sent letters to frighten me. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us to gather together in your house, Father, during this time, to look into your word, Father, to be led by your spirit, Father, to sing your praises. And Father, in all of it, we pray that you would reveal to us our sinfulness. And Father, that you would reveal to us your righteousness. Father, that we can repent of our sins, that we can walk in your righteousness. Father, that we can uh, know you more, that we can walk ever closer by your side. And Father, that we can shine your light to this world that you've placed us in. Father, that we would always be ready to speak your truth and love. Father, to stand boldly. And Father, to do all that we can to bring glory to your name. In all things, Father, we pray only because of the shed blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, so 
here we are, chapter 6 of Nehemiah. And uh, we've seen Nehemiah come back into the city. Uh, there with the city walls are destroyed, the gates are destroyed. We talked about that being the limits, the parameters, the dividing line between what, what is God's and what is the lost world's. And then also the city gates were a place of justice and also a place of culture. And that over the years that they had lost this dividing line. They had lost what was, what was God's and what was not God's. They had lost what, what habitation was for the Lord and the Lord's people and what was of the lost world. And today in America and in the American church, we've also lost those lines. People can't tell what belongs to the Lord, what is holy and what is righteous, what we should be partaking in, what we should endorse, and the things which are of the lost world, which we should have nothing to do with. There is a blending that has taken place. It is time for the people of God to build walls. But in the same time as we build walls, that there's also gates to be hung. And, and those gates are a place of justice, a place of what's right, what's wrong, and also a place of culture. For too long, we've given culture over to the lost world. And look at what we've got, a bunch of filthy mess. Every entertainment sort is some form of perversity, is some form of lostness. It's something that is against God's creative design and God's purpose for the family. It's time for us also to reclaim and begin to build culture. So as Nehemiah undertakes this, the, the rest of the community comes together with him. And after 140 years of this blending, 140 years of this giving themselves over and exposure to the lost world, what we finally see is everybody come together. And, and in 140 years, a work had not been done. But now the work is done in only 52 years days. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine living with a problem for 140 years knowing that the cure is only 52 days away? Sadly, that's where most of us are. We know things right now in our homes that should take place. We know things in our own lives that we should repent of. We know things that are impacting us and, and that are, are sinful that we're holding on to and we're carrying for years, for generations. We're passing it down to our children and our grandchildren when all it takes is a work of repentance. And that work of repentance can be worked right now and can bear fruit in your life, in your children's life, and in your grandchildren's life. But instead, we hold on to it because we make excuses, because we're scared of what it's going to take. And, and the work that would have to be done in the short term isn't fun and isn't pleasurable. But there's fruitfulness on the other side of the work. We've seen the, the enemies come alongside, and as they began to build, that the enemies surrounded them and continuously harassed them and insulted them and put them down and, and uh, made disparaging comments about the people of God as they were endeavoring in this work. We even saw that as they confront the enemies and as they defend their decisions and defend the work that God has ordained them to do, that not only was there uh, enemies on the outside, but it was also revealed that there were great problems on the inside. That there they were having to sell their children into slavery. They were having to work extra and still not be able to make ends meet. That things were happening on the inside. And so Nehemiah has to take a break from the work on the outside to focus on the inside. And fresh off of those problems and fresh off of getting over the problem of the rulers and the nobles actually working against the people in the best interest of the nation, here we see chapter 6. And Nehemiah comes to the place where now the walls are almost complete. They're, they're built, they're laid, and there's just the final touches to be, to be made, the final gates to be hung, the final stones to be put into place. And now Tobiah and Sanballat become, decide that they need to meet with Nehemiah. Now, this meeting, no doubt, wasn't friendly in its, in its essence. In fact, Nehemiah says that they planned to do him harm. They wanted to lure him out away from the people, away from the protection, out from behind the walls, and they wanted to lure him to this valley of Ono so that then they could kill him, that they could harm him, that they could rough him up and scare him uh, so that he would then retreat away and quit doing what the God had called him to do. We see that 
He initially turns this down, and that four more times there's a plea sent to him. And I'm sure they probably change locations trying to make something more palatable to make him feel more secure. And so they moved it a little closer and a little closer to the city. The very first invitation was about 30 miles outside of Jerusalem. And so they probably moved it to different locations and different terms and different people meeting with them to try to make Nehemiah just to lure him into a sense of comfort to get him out from behind the walls. And finally, a fifth time, they send a letter to him. And that letter says, Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall, that you may be their king, and that you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, there is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. They came to him with the threat of that they were going to go to the government, they were going to go to the king, they were going to go to the ruling authority and tell him that what they were planning to do was to rebel against him, that they had some allegiance that was higher than the king, they had some allegiance higher than the king of Persia, that Artaxerxes didn't sit as the prime authority in the lives of God's people, and they were going to threaten Nehemiah with this to tell him, if you don't come and meet with us, then we're going to turn you into the government. We're going to appeal to a, to a different earthly authority that will, try to, that will try to punish you, that will bring harm against you. They saw Artaxerxes as the one high and lifted up. They saw Artaxerxes as the one that was the supreme authority. When they got up in the morning and when they said their prayers of protection, they were praying to Artaxerxes. When they looked at the provisions on their table, they were saying, thank Artaxerxes. Everything in their life revolved around this knowledge, this sense of security that the government was in control and that nobody better dare cross that government. But in Nehemiah's mind and in the people of God's mind, there was a king in Judah. And that king was not Artaxerxes. That there was a supreme authority that gave them their sense of being, who breathed life into them, that was their blesser, that was their protector, that was their provision, and it wasn't some king hundreds of miles away. But rather, it was the one true God. Today in America, there's very many people who are more scared of the government than they are of God Almighty. And that they would rather transgress God, they'd rather spit in the face of their creator than to ever do anything that was against a policy of some godless government sitting thousands of miles away. And when they're blesser, when they think of all that they have, they think that they have what they have because of the government. But let me tell you, friends, there is a king over the United States. And his name is Jesus. And he's the king of kings and he's the Lord of lords. And let me tell you, the biggest political statement that you can ever make that will carry any weight in your life is that Jesus is king. And until you can say that with your whole heart that Jesus is king, then I'm sorry, you have something wrong about you. You've been taught and you've been trained and you've been immersed in, in a godless culture and you've been raised by a godless government and you've been schooled in godless uh, thought and godless philosophy. But there is a king in Judah. There is a king in the United States. There is a king in Alabama. There's a king in Op, and that king is Jesus, and Jesus alone. And what Jesus says, that's what Jesus' people will do. And where Jesus speaks, that's where Jesus' people will obey. And where Jesus blesses, that's where his people will harvest. You can't have a harvest without the Lord's hand upon you. Nothing in this world will work without his blessings raining down upon you. And you may think that you can do it outside of God, but let me tell you, the only reason that you survive, the only reason that you thrive, the only reason that you have anything in this world is because God reigns upon the just and the unjust. Don't take his mercy for your own pride. 
And don't mistake His goodness for your greatness. The only reason that you have anything is because God decided to allow you to have it. He's the blesser of blesser, the creator of creators. He's the author. He's the finisher. He is all in all. All things exist because of Him, through Him, and they are sustained by Him. And when the day comes that he tires of this world, it will all pass away. And there's no strength that you have. There's no power within your veins. There's no authority that you can call on to that will usurp the power of King Jesus. In the book of Revelation, it says that in that day, as everything's falling apart, that they'll flee to the mountains and pray that the rocks fall down upon them. That's what your government will do. That's what your kings will do. That's what your celebrities will do. That's what your social media influencers will do. They will pray for death, and death will not find them until it's time. Because even death is subjugated to King Jesus. So in that, they come to him with Nehemiah, and they say, we're going to tell the king. And Nehemiah says, you don't know what king to tell. He says, in fact, all of that that you say, all of this rebellion that you think we have, all that the evil that you've dreamed up, that's just in your heart. He said, we've always served one God, and we realize that, that powers and everything else was put into place by him or at his discretion, that they're either righteous powers that we need or they're unjust powers that we deserve. And in that, that either God is blessing us or God is judging us. And friends, let me tell you right now, in the United States of America, God is judging us. We are facing the very judgment hand of God. Well, why? Well, look at our families and look at our cultures. Look at what we've deemed acceptable. Look at the things that we've allowed. Look how we stopped building God's kingdom and we started building our own kingdom. You look at how the the mortgage companies and the credit card companies and the car companies are overfunded, and you look at how the houses of God are underfunded. You look at how ball games are attended, and you look at how the house of the Lord is unattended. You look at the place of priority that we place on our own leisure and our own entertainment, and you look at how the training and instruction of our children goes to the wayside. God is judging us. We have the king that we deserve. We don't have the king that we need. So in that, he tells them, he says that that you dream up these things, that you've invented them in your own heart, that we understand that God is king. He's always been king, that there's no king above him. And so in that, you've just dreamed this up as some plot, some plan, because you don't understand that there is a king above who you call a king. Then he goes on and he tells us that there's this, after this plan to intimidate, after this plan to harm Nehemiah comes to no fruition whatsoever, that there's a secondary plan that takes over. Now Tobiah begins writing letters and because he's intermarried, or rather because the people of God have intermarried with the godless Tobiah, now that there's this letter writing campaign that goes back and forth. And Nehemiah doesn't stop it because they are relatives. They are friends of Tobiah inside of Jerusalem. And so there's this correspondence constantly going back. All of a sudden, uh, Tobiah becomes pen pals. And he's writing these letters to cause discord to try to undermine the authority of Nehemiah. And so all of the rulers and all of the, the nobles are getting these letters from Tobiah saying, Nehemiah's lost his mind. Nehemiah's off his rocker. Nehemiah has other plans. Nehemiah is going to try to set himself up as a king among you. Now, Nehemiah was the governor, and he didn't even take a salary. That's a really bad way to become king, isn't it? Nehemiah didn't exert taxes off of the people, but rather Nehemiah worked out of his own uh, treasures, out of his own household, and supplied the needs for 150 Jews during that time that were weak and who were needy and who were beggarly. It's a really bad way to take over and to exert power. 
And so Tobiah begins this letter-writing campaign back and forth, trying to disturb the social order, trying to wreak havoc upon the people groups, to try to influence any leader, any authority that he possibly could to undermine the authority of Nehemiah. When false accusations don't work, my friends, false, false friends will. And then we see this curious point. This man steps to the forefront that we haven't heard of yet. And in verse 10, it talks about Shemaiah. And Shemaiah is a priest and a prophet. But the problem with Shemaiah is that Shemaiah was for hire. He was just like Balaam. He wanted to know how much money he was going to get paid to say what. And he, his mouth was connected to his checkbook. And so whoever had the biggest amount of money to pay, well, that's the one who was going to get the good words. That's the one who he was going to skew the message towards. That's the one that he was going to try to rally towards. He was simply for hire. He had been bribed. He'd been paid off. In the same way, the American pulpit has been bribed and it's been paid off. In that, they, they think that they can pander and that they can uh, just cower to whoever and that they can just speak uh, sweet nothings. They can say peace, peace when there is no peace, that they can just try to give you some points of morality, that they can just encourage you a little bit, and they never tell you what your God has said. And they never point to the Word of God to tell you exactly what He has to say on matters, but rather what's popular. What's going to get them clicks? What's going to make them go viral? What's going to build these large facilities that are absence of the power of God? And so they have to manipulate it and they have to play to your senses and they have to play to your carnality in order to get you to attend, in order to get you to come. They have to make their, their services more worldly rather than more holy. And they have to do the things that sell instead of the things which God has said. And they'll go whichever way the wind blows. They'll go with whatever current that's popular at the time. They'll change with the winds and change with the seasons, and they'll mold themselves according to the lost pagan culture instead of being molded according to the will of God. And so Shemaiah comes to him, and Shemaiah falsely lies to him, and he says, they're going to try to kill you. They were trying to get you outside the gates, and that didn't work, so now they're going to send assassins in here. In fact, Nehemiah, they're going to send assassins this very night. Your only refuge, your only place, your only recourse is for you to come hide in the holy place of the temple. That sounds like a pretty good plan, doesn't it? To run into the holy place, yell sanctuary, to close the doors, and there that surely they wouldn't dare to come in. Those nobles, those rulers, those pen pals of Tobiah, surely they would never disgrace God by going into a place that they're not allowed to go. The problem, friends, is that this was a trap. The problem is, is that this was a devious scam to try to discredit Nehemiah. Nehemiah wasn't allowed to go into the holy place. That was reserved for the priests. And so with that, if he would have retreated into it, it would have undermined and discredited him. It would have undermined his authority of a man standing up saying, Thus saith the Lord, calling a nation to repentance. And if they could only get him on a moral failure, if they could only get his character impugned, if they could only lower him to a place and have something, some fault, some anything that they could possibly say about Nehemiah, that they knew that they could turn the hearts of God's people away from God because of a failure of a man. They still do that today. They still do that today. They know that if they can take down the heroes, if they can take down the ones that God is using at the moment, if they can take down the ones who are speaking the word of God clearly and truly, that then they can silence, that they can influence the hearts of the masses, and that they could all discredit the work which God is doing by discrediting the man which God is using. But what they didn't count on was Nehemiah's character. What they didn't count on was Nehemiah's character. Look at what Nehemiah tells them. He says, 
verse 11, should such a man as I flee? Should such a man as I flee? And then he goes on, he says, and who is there such as I who would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. In that, they didn't count on the manliness and the bravado of Nehemiah. They didn't count on the courage of Nehemiah. He'd been standing already against impossible odds. He'd been trying to change the hearts of the masses, which had been raised cowardly for 140 years, who had a shut up and take it kind of mentality, who just, you know, stay quiet, fly under the radar kind of mentality. He had already been fighting those. He had already been fighting the lost world around him, who was begging him to compromise, was begging him to give in, was begging him just to see what price it would take for them to go away and and here Nehemiah stands against all and he's still prepared to stand. Nehemiah was a man of character. Nehemiah would stand when everybody else was running. Nehemiah would stand when everybody else was negotiating with the enemy. Nehemiah stood firm and stood strong because he knew who he was standing for. While everybody else was profiteering, he was standing for God. While everybody else was cowering and compromising, he stood strong. And now when it's a specific threat against his very own life, he says, why would a man like me run and hide? Why would a man like me run and hide? We need more Nehemiahs in this world today. We need more men who say, I don't care what it costs, I'm going to do what God says. I don't care what others say. I'm going to do exactly what God says. I don't care how unpopular it makes me. I only care what God says. I don't care what the cost is. I only care what God says. And they say, oh, there's trouble. Will you bring trouble on? But you better bring a lot of trouble. Because what you got is you've got a man who's standing for his God. He's standing resolute. And when a man stands for his God, his God is standing for that man. It's not who who is fighting, but it's who that man is fighting for. And if that man be for God, then God be for that man. And, And God bless anybody who tries to stand against those. That's all we need is some men to stand resolute and say, No, my God says this, and that's all that we're going to do. Why would a man such as I run and flee? Why would a man such as I hide? And why would a man such as I disgrace the very God which I stand for? Why would a man such as I transgress his commandments? Why would a man such as I dare do anything that's against the will of God because he is God? Nehemiah stands strong against Shemaiah. And he tells him, he says, no, you know, running and hiding, that's for cowards. And there's plenty of cowards if you want to find them. There's plenty plenty of people who can be bought off. There's plenty of people who would engage in selfishness. There's plenty of people who are only thinking of themselves, their next breath, and their next meal. But as for me, I'm thinking about the one true God. And so he pushes back away from Shemaiah. He finds the false prophets, he names them. All of a sudden, all of this crowd and this congregation, it's not just Shemaiah, but it's also all of these others, Noadiah and a host of other false prophets who are all simply for hire. Friends, let me tell you, be careful of who you listen to. Today, we live in a world where you have access to preaching 24-7, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can hear preachers all over the country, all over this nation, and most of them are terrible. Most of them are pitiful. Most of them ain't worth listening to. Most of them are just preaching something that they heard, not what they heard from the Lord. They're preaching something that's going to make the offering bigger, not what's going to glorify the name of God. They've given themselves over. They've compromised themselves in many ways. They make excuses for sin because compromised men will always preach a compromised gospel. And in that, I would warn you to judge their hearts. Just because they are prophesying does not make them a prophet of God. Just because they stand in a pulpit and they've got first month's rent and a microphone does not make them a messenger of the one true God. You be careful and you be discerning. 
You be ones who are so in the Word that as soon as they step out of the Word, you know it, you recognize it, and your ears shut off. That you can point to them and you say, you did a good job entertaining, but you didn't preach God's Word. You did a good job being cute, but you can take that to the comedy club because you didn't say what God said. In that, I don't care how inspirational it is. If it's not the Word of God, it's damnable, and it's a, it's a lie from hell. I don't care how cute he is, how jailed up his hair is, how sweet the praise band is, any of that kind of mess. If it's not the Word of God, straight and true, then it's false. In that, we need to be more discerning. There are false prophets. They're sent out to, to lie. They're sent out to engage with God's people. There's wolves among the sheep. It's time for us to be wise. It's time for us to have discerning ears. It's time for us to say, not just that it sounds good, but is it correct? The only way to know that is for you to know that Bible. The only way for you to know that is for you to be so engaged with the Word of God that you know it backwards and forwards and that you can discern truth from false. In fact, friends, do you know what, what, the, what the ministry of discernment is? Very often we think discernment is just simply telling right from wrong, but it's telling right from almost right. That's discernment. That something can almost sound right, but we know that it's not fully right. Here, Nehemiah has to overcome Sanballat. He has to overcome the letter-writing uh, campaign of Tobiah trying to undermine his authority. He has to deal with Shemaiah and the false prophets trying to discredit him and trying to bring him into some kind of charge, some kind of situations to where he will compromise himself so that they can say something wrong about him. But look finally when he comes to it in verse 15. When all is said and done, after the final gasps of desperation are held by the enemies of God, those who are compromised outside, those who are compromised inside, those false prophets who are for hire. He says in verse 15, So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. That's bragging right there. He says 140 years and we got it done in 52 days. People said it couldn't be done and it only took 52 days. People said it would never happen, and it happened in 52 days. Generations said it couldn't be done, and it only took two months. And it happened when all of our enemies heard of it, and all the nations around us saw these things, they were very disheartened in their own eyes. Look, right here is the important verse. For they perceived that this work was done by our God. Now, Nehemiah could easily be one that was filled with pride. He could easily be braggadocious. He could easily pump his chest and, and say, look what I've done. It took men uh, uh, of generations upon generations of laying down, of being cowards. It was easy for everybody to say it couldn't happen. And look what one Nehemiah did. Look at what I did. Look, everybody here knows that it was me, that I was the catalyst, that I was the ignition, that I was the starting point, that, man, I carried the heavy burden, and I got it done. But look who Nehemiah points to. We should expect no less. After knowing his character, after knowing that all that has happened, Nehemiah took no pride, he took no credit among himself, but rather he said, the enemies saw it and they were disheartened because they knew that God did this. Because they knew that God was in control. That they knew that God was behind this project and if they were against it, that meant that they were against God. They were wrong. In that Nehemiah takes no pride, he takes no selfishness, he realizes that he's just the vessel. Friends, listen, when God does great things through us, when God raises up great families behind us, when we see great changes in our life, when we see a, a multitude of blessedness come into our coffers and fill our checkbooks, let us always remember it was God, it wasn't us. Every blessing is from God. Every problem is usually from us. Every good thing comes from God. Every sin comes from us. 
So in that, if God chooses to use us, he very often chooses to use us because of our weaknesses, not because of our strengths. It's easy for us to pump our chest and to become proud and, and prideful and braggadocious in ourselves and think that, man, God used this because of how strong I am, how smart I am, how, how compelling I am, because I did something. But in that, God uses the weak things of this world to confound the wise. God uses us because of our weakness. God, very often, when he chooses someone, he chooses someone for whom that they could never receive the credit. They say, if that old boy did it, I know it had to be God because he's kind of dumb. If that old boy did it, then I know God must have been in it because he doesn't have the talent, he doesn't have the range, he doesn't have anything in him that would allow that to be done. God must be doing that work right there. And God obtains the credit and God receives the glory. Let us always be given to the point of knowing our own limitations and also knowing a limitless God. Of knowing that we could never do it, but God can do all things. That God can go all places. God can overthrow all powers. That God can, can, uh, can supersede all things. And that God makes the miraculous happen. Because it's not miraculous to Him. God's never been astounded by anything. God's yet to see anything that man does and think it's remarkable. The only thing that God respects, the only thing that God points out, and the only thing that, that God truly looks upon man and gives any recognition to is faith. Is faith of knowing who God is and believing in Him. Of knowing who God is, what He's capable of, and all that He can do, and giving Him the glory, giving Him the credit of giving Him all. All the accolades that are, that are due, and he is due all the accolades. Friends, first off, we see that there is opposition. There will be opposition. There's always opposition. That on this side of, of the glorious kingdom, that we will always be opposed when we do things for God. If you make a resolution to repent, you make a resolution to change the course of your family, to change the culture of your family, there will be opposition. If you choose to change what, what is going to receive the most glory in your life and also the most glory in your death, then guess what? You will face opposition. There will be naysayers. There will be those who come along and call you foolish. There will be those who say that you can't do it that way. Nobody lives that way. There's no sense in that. There will always be opposition. Get used to it. Expect it. Don't be caught off guard when, when the enemy opposes you. If this world would crucify the Son of God, what would it do to you? In that, expect it so that you're not caught off guard. Secondly, friends, character will keep you. You get so in tune with God, you make such a resolute decision that this is what we're going to do and this is how we're going to do it and we're going to live by that book and we're going to obey every word in it. We're going to take things serious. We're not going to uh, just throw half of our effort at it any longer. And you allow that character to build. You strengthen yourself by putting yourself around other men, by other women who are of the Lord, who are uh, dedicated to His ways, and you become absolute steadfast in your approach, in your demeanor, in, in your approach to this life, that you say, I'm absolutely going to do what God says. And your character will take you over a great many adversaries, over a great many oppositions, and it will keep you from a great many sins. That we should grow in our sanctification. And lastly, friends, when God does it, because God will do it, and when God builds the house, when God makes a way, when God claims the victory, give Him the credit. It wasn't you. You didn't do it. You can't stand against one demon. You can't overcome one sin. You're so weak and depraved. You're so lost without the power of God in your life that you can't do it. So when God does it, you give him glory. When somebody congratulates you, when somebody sees something in you, and when they see the power of God move through you, and they try to give you the credit, you just pass that credit right on to God. And you say, I just did what God said. I just obeyed him. God filled my lungs. God's the one that gave me the inspiration. God gave me that idea. All I did was apply God's principles. All I did was be led by God's spirit. There's no glory here. 
It's all his. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for allowing us to gather together in your house. Father, to read your word, to be led by your spirit. Father, we do pray, Lord, that you wouldn't allow us to be intimidated. You wouldn't allow us to be undermined. Father, you wouldn't allow us to fall for the schemes to be discredited. Lord, that we wouldn't be overcome by false accusations. That we wouldn't be uh, uh, weakened by false friendships or distracted by false prophets. But Father, that we would have only eyes for you. That we would be led by your word and your spirit alone. Father, that we would care about your opinion only. And Father, that in the end, that we would give you all the credit. Father, we thank you and we praise you and we love you, Father. We ask all this in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Won't you stand?